Welcome today. Great to see you all online. So I have a confession to make, and, and it's quite difficult to tell you because I've been spending years trying to hide this. So the confession is it's, it's actually by background and by career. I'm actually an IT programmer. Yes, I, I know it's hard to admit, admit, and I'm sure there's a few of you out there who perhaps come from a similar background and you spent for a few years, 30 years in my case, pretending you're not. I started out as a basic programmer writing computer games, that's basic with a capital B, and then I moved to COBOL. Uh, and if you know either of these languages, then you're like me and you ought to be thinking about retiring soon. So, um, so, but, so I started as a programmer, I was actually quite good at it. In fact, I was so good at it that one day they promoted me to be a project manager. So that was fantastic. And I had a team and I, I worked with my team and I remember sitting with them uh, and asking them to do things. And sometimes they did it and sometimes they didn't do it. And I wasn't quite sure why, but, but you know, I kept, kept telling them to do things. And when they did, it was great because I could go back to doing programming again. Um, and um, I turned out that I was actually quite good at that too, or I seemed to be good at that, because the next thing they did is that I, they pro promoted me to be an IT manager. So this was my first IT manager job. It was actually at a, um, I had the exalted title of head of management services at a very large university in London in the UK. Now, I should have realized there was something missing in the job description when I arrived at the university, because for the first week, I couldn't actually get to my office and I couldn't actually get into the university because there were pickets outside. There were unions outside who just wouldn't let us in. Um, and, and for those of you, if any of you there are working in um, uh, government, you'll be used to politics. And, and actually universities with its mix of faculties and the, and the different faculties and the, and the faculty staff and the management staff, it's one of the most political environments I've ever worked in. And I had what seemed to be a really exciting job. I was going to implement a program for the implementation of change right across the university. It would affect every single person in the university. Um, effectively, we were moving our courses to modular based courses. But it turned out that except for my direct management team, everybody hated this project. And, and even some of the management team I wasn't really sure about. I'd never before experienced such widespread, vehement aggression about a project that I was running. Uh, and this was such a new experience. It's the only job where I've actually had to find places in the organization to go away and cry in. Now, there is a happy ending to this story. The program was a success. But what happened to me is I realized that I had to change. The first, probably most important thing was I found a mentor or possibly she found me, um, not in the tra traditional sense of a mentor as somebody who came in and kind of told me what to do. It was actually the HR director. And what she helped me understand was a network of players that I needed to work with. Um, and furthermore, she helped me to build those relationships, which were going to be absolutely necessary in political project environments. She helped me make those contacts. So the first learning for me was the more I invested in relationships and develop relationships, basically the more sizable my leadership bank account would be. Because leadership is not just about getting things done. And up until then, that's what I thought I was there to do was just to get things done or get things accomplished. Leadership is about relating to a group of people. It's fostering that compelling relationship with them and helping them to relate and commit to the cause or the purpose of the project you're trying to achieve. So I'm going to suggest to you that relationship is a currency of our leadership. And therefore, we must know how we're investing. We must know how we are cultivating relationships around us. The second lesson I had in order to achieve that, because, of course, it's not just about knowing people. It's about getting them to come along on that journey with you. And that second lesson was that I had to really get to grips with this. I had to really get to grips with influence. I was no longer working with what I call role based stakeholders, people who are directly involved in my project or part of my team. I was working with stakeholders with multiple agendas with respect to my project. 
I couldn't use authority. I, I couldn't tell them what to do like I used to tell my team. In fact, if I told them what to do, I, well, I can tell you what the kind of language that lecturers use. Um, so the, the other thing I then realized is that I had to change the way that I actioned my role. So let's get a shared view on influence here, make sure we're talking from the same hymn book. Power and influence are terms commonly used in leadership. Power is very often thought of as authoritarian, the use of stick and carrot, uh, giving people rewards or maybe giving people punishments for not doing what you want them to do. It can even be thought of as forceful or even providing fear, getting people frightened so they have to do it. But there are other ways of using power that doesn't use force. But in this kind of authoritarian approach, what we do is we get people to do things irrespective of whether they think it's in their own interest, irrespective sometimes of whether they want to do it or not. But influence is different. It's about shaping people's values and beliefs. Basically, it's about getting them to, to kind of want to do what you want them to do. Um, and um, uh, in, in, in influencing, we have to get at some of these other things. We have to appeal to their values um, because if we can appeal to their underlying values and we can change their attitudes and if they change their attitudes, they change their behave behaviors. So there I was, how, how then do you influence people to get them to do what you want them to do, to actually feel positively that they align their agendas with your agenda? It's kind of a big subject, but I'm gonna start with persuasion. And to me, the master of persuasion is a guy called Cialdini or Cialdini. And if you haven't seen this book or read this book, then it's perhaps one for your management shelf. So, so Cialdini in a, in a series of studies, he worked with several, well, hundreds of people really. Um, and he took people who were very good at getting people to do things, very good at influencing others. And what he tried to, tried to find out is what did they do to influence? How, how had they become effective influencers? And he eventually ended up with this seven lists of the best ways of influencing people by persuasion. They're not in any particular order. What it turns out is that you can use different techniques depending upon the circumstances. So I'm going to concentrate on three of them because they directly relate to the quality of our networks. So this first one, reciprocation. The truth is that, we, that genuinely, if you do some, a favor for somebody, then they like to return it. We actually don't like to feel indebted. Think about some of the old timers or people in your own organizations who, who appear to be able to get things done reasonably well. How do they get it done? Well, of course, some of the time it's because they've built up these trusted networks, but partly it's also the credit that they've built up because you know, they've done something, they've helped with, out with a project and now other people help them out with a project. So there's this reciprocation process going on all the time. People like to pay back. One of the problems that you have when you come new into a company or indeed if you're a contractor outside of the company is that you may not be able to easily build up this credit. Indeed, you may not even have time to do it. You're in and out of the project, you won't get that time. On the example I talked about from the university, I could have gone to my boss, the vice chancellor, the head of the university, and asked him to make people do things for me. But that is the use of power and it's the use of legitimate power and it wouldn't have worked. The HR director effectively lent me her credit for a while. And how did I reciprocate? Well, I reciprocated by, I made it very clear to the vice chancellor where I was getting my support from and her credit in the management team was reinforced by it. So this kind of give and take is really important in organizations. And it often happens without us thinking consciously about it occurring. And this one, liking. Yes, it does make a difference if people like you. And lots of evidence shows that, by the way, flattering people and praising them produces greater compliance. So I mean, how many times have you been out into your organization and you've thanked people and said, whether it's to your sponsor or to your team and said what you did made a real difference. You did a great job there. And it turns out that that kind of praise creates more likability and it creates more like uh, more compliance. They want to help you. They want to do what you want them to do. Mirroring and matching is another example of this. Mirroring is a concept where, where when you are with somebody, you actually follow their kind of behaviors. Um, and that's used quite a lot in advertising where you, uh, 
I'm going to use a hair advert example here. So excuse me, let's not talk about clicks and all this kind of thing. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, it used to be the case that what the hair advert people would do is they put on the screen um, actresses who were very well known and they would have the most amazing hair. But when they did their research, what they found is that we tend not to be persuaded by actresses. We're much more likely to be persuaded by having somebody on the advert who looks like us. So we are much more likely to, um, to actually get on and like people who are like us. So we like to help people who are like us. Um, and people tend to say yes to people they like. Can you see how my theme here, why I'm making this case for, in both of these in particular, why your networks might be important to you? Reciprocation relies on your networks and building your networks and building that credit up. And of course, liking, um, getting people to actually uh, relate to you um, comes back to some of your networks. And, and this third one, social proof, I think this is quite interesting. Um, if everybody else is doing it, then it's got to be a good thing. In the old days, we used to call it the IBM effect. Nobody ever got shot for buying IBM. But the real truth of this one is that leaders need followers. So if you, in actual fact, to be a leader, you have to have followers. And it's the quality of those followers that create other followers. If you have a network in which people like you or people say good things about you or people say what she or he is doing is good, then you are tying into social proof because other people can then say, yeah, Louise is or yes, look, other people think she's doing a good job and therefore they are more influenced by you. Now, um, Chiltini talks about some other factors. I'm not going to, to dwell on those today. You can go and have a look at his book, but there are some interesting things. Consistency, I like consistency because really what it's getting at is authentic leadership. People like to be recognized as consistent. They also like leaders who are consistent. And he talks about authority and, and the one that marketing uses this all the time, which is, oh, if you don't buy it now, then it won't be available anymore. IT use it, by the way, with their clients when they say things like, if we don't move to version five now, then, and I'm sure you recognize it, it's, it's almost like a scare factor. But, but the important thing is, is that those first three, um, they, at least some aspects of persuasion are fundamentally based upon the extent and the quality of the relationships we have in our organizations. So how do project managers get better at doing this kind of thing? So on my academic side, my area of research some 15, 20 years ago was what makes project managers successful. And at that time, we were looking at what, what were the characteristics of highly successful project managers. And we found some interesting things. The first one um, that I always go back to is that the most important behavioral characteristic with a high performing group we looked at was integrity. So on tough projects, you might call it bravery. You know, when you're faced by people who don't really want to hear it as it is, and you have to be the one that goes out there and say, no, you know, this is this is the problem. This is the status. You got to, This is actually the bad news, and I have to be there to tell it. In modern day leadership language, this is also relates to the idea of being the authentic leader. And there are overlaps here with some of the descriptions we see in things like servant leadership, but beware, servant leadership is only a small part of authentic leadership. Okay, what else do we learn about these great project managers? Well, they don't spend much time sitting at their desks. At least 30 to 50% of their time any one week, they seem to be out there talking to people, monitoring. They didn't just sit and monitor and write status reports. What they did is went out and they asked those questions. How are you doing? What can I do to help you? Um, what's, what's your barriers at the moment? Do you know what you're supposed to be doing this week? So they were out there talking to people. And perhaps most importantly, what we found is that these successful project managers, in most cases, they had far more extended networks back in their organizations than the less successful project managers. It was almost like they appeared to have deliberate strategies for creating these networks. So I'm gonna to ask to do a little bit of sharing now. Um, and for those of you who managed to get to Mentimeter, that's fantastic. Let me now, um, I'm just going to pull up the Mentimeter screen. Um, for those of you who haven't got onto Mentimeter now, you can get onto it by just doing uh, menti.com um, and it will ask you for a code, which is 8346995. Um, and- Anne-Louise, 
Okay, there are two questions I've got you. One is, do you want to maybe put your video on? Because I can't put it on and people can see you speaking as well. And then maybe let's just put that code in the chat again. Uh, if you can, you just give it to me again. So it's mentimeter.com. And I think you, sh you should be able to see it on your screen now. It's at the top of the screen up here. Can you see that code? Are you able to see the menti? Um, just give it to me again because it might be small for some people. H3. Four six nine nine five, and I'm now sharing the screen, showing your answers coming through. Can you see that, everybody? Yes, we can see. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, I'd love to put my. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say, despite the fact I'm a computer programmer, I'm actually on a desktop without a um, video today. So sorry about that. I can't put my screen on. But I. <laughs> but I, I can. Well, I couldn't switch you on. <laughs> okay. Now that explains it. Just as well, because the cat's just leapt on my lap. So I'm just going to get him out of the way. So we can see here, look at this. Um, uh, we have some people who are making lots of connections here um, and some people who are, who are not making so many connections here. I'm going to ask somebody to, to be a volunteer for me. Somebody who has said none, they've made no connections over the last six months. Um, just unmic yourself and just comment on that. What what is it because you know you don't need to or because uh, whatever. Anybody who said none, just unmic yourself and get in there. Oh no, volunteers. So I still want to encourage people to, to step forward. It's not wrong. And COVID could be the reason. Does anybody want to suggest? Dan, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go to the greater than because there's lots of reasons why we might suddenly have to make lots of networks. Um, sometimes <coughs> it's to do with coming in new to an organization. Somebody who has, who's made lots of connections recently, would they like to comment for me? Louise, I'm happy to. Nicole, yep. you go. Yeah, so I am relatively new. Um, you're within actually on the 1st of October. So, uh, um, but I picked up a whole new program um, delivering our IT strategy. So many stakeholders um, across the IT organization, um, as well as technical leads for delivery. So I've had to have a lot of workshops and meetings with people to scope out. Absolutely. And that, that's often the case when you go in you, you know, we get we have to be very active. OK, and there's somebody else who's going to talk on that one. Uh, Louise, so I'm not new in my environment, but I've just picked up on two new projects. And so that's obviously forced me to, um, to create connections with people that I have not previously had relationships with. Fantastic. And, and in many ways, this is almost like a thermometer check for you. If you are on a new project and you and, and particularly if it's in a new environment, then um, then you, you should you should be making some new connections. One of the reasons that sometimes organizations keep project managers within the same sectors, you know, if you're in retail, for example, I know when I've worked with pick and pay, often they'll have project managers and they only work within certain areas. And that's because they get to know the people. But don't, but don't forget the people change as well. So you still have to get to know them. Okay, what about this next question? I'm gonna ask you to look at the next question now. Um, Louise? Yeah. There are a few people in the chat who are saying they misunderstood the question and answered none, but they actually had made some new connections. So just to mention to you that that's the conversation that's happening there. Fantastic. Now. Grant, I know you really do talk to people. <laughs> Okay, so this is a different kind of sharing. This is now not about your new connections, but, but how, what are you doing about your people that you know? And you can put free text on this one. So you can put a few, you know, just a little sentence to say, well, what are you doing to, to keep those network connections warm and to build those relationships? It'll take a little bit longer on this one to come up because obviously you've got to write a few words and things. But what are you, what are you out there doing and how are you making sure you keep those connections warm, that they still like you and they still feel connected to you?
Okay, so we're beginning to see, see some of them come up. So you can see things like regular communication. I remembered birthdays. <laughs> We've got a couple of, I bet those are ladies. And now I'm being sexist. Um, communication and keep motivated. They, it's interesting to see regular communication. Regular communication to me sounds like formal communication. It might not be. Whereas something like sending a birthday card is informal communication. Um, somebody's got here ongoing, ongoing, I think that's ongoing, ongoing casual engagements. Um, I think I think we we know what you mean there. That's an informal types of um, uh, communications going on. Communication and knowledge sharing looks a little bit like formal. Scheduling meetings with people in faraway places. Okay, attending forums and events. A little bit like formal. What's a high email? That looks interesting. Send regular high emails to find out what's new. We have done a few coffees LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, can I just ask who would you mind unmiking the send regular high emails? What what did you mean by that? It's Nicole um Louise. It's just really a, a hello email. Uh, yes. Hi, how are you? What's happening? Anything new your side? Bit of an update. Yeah. my side if there's been any interesting job postings or things that I think somebody will be interested in or any articles that I think would be in their field of interest any books etc yes absolutely and what what's corporate gifting efforts to keep in touch with network and corporate gifting what did you mean by that who did that one there corporate gifting happy to share any more I'm keeping them coming. Oh, use of WhatsApp. Um, a couple of people are talking about WhatsApp. How is WhatsApp different, do you think, when you're keeping up your communications with people? Who put this one here? Drop a WhatsApp message. Uh, Louise, that was me. And um, I think um, what often happens is that people prioritize their emails and they, they look at the more socially inclined emails a lot less frequently. Whereas if a WhatsApp message pops up on their phone, you know, people seem, seem to respond. I mean, that's worked very well for me, especially during lockdown. Yes. Um, if somebody would say, thank you so much for checking in on me. I'm doing well, you know, um, how's your project? And then a whole conversation starts. And it doesn't take very long, but um, just that, that effort to make the connection um, – on, on a personal platform like WhatsApp. Yeah, and it's a different form of medium, isn't it, as well? Virtual team, what's a virtual team Friday drinks meeting? That sounds fantastic. I want one of those. Uh, um, Louise, that was from me. And so just so that you know, as part of our, uh, there were a group of us on a team that weren't necessarily still working together, but had been working quite closely together in the past. So every few Fridays, we organized um, 4.30 or 5 o'clock um, a drinks meeting. We all had our glass of our preference and we chatted on Zoom. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and do you notice how her speech was slightly slurred there, I felt? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Louise. <laughs> okay, so you can see here we've got this mix of informal and formal types of, of engaging with people because it changes our relationship with them. Okay, I'm going to um, just change my sharing back now, back to the presentation, um, and um, we'll continue. We will have one other go at the uh, Mentimeter, but... Uh, so, so in workshops with project managers, and, and I've done several of them in networking, I get them to consider who is in their network. And I did one recently and a senior project manager summarized his views quite well. He said, I think when you've been in an organization for a long time, you get lazy and you stick with the people you know, even though most of them have left, which I thought was quite funny when he said that. And, and I think that's something for us to ask ourselves as well. We've talked about, I think it was Nicole, you know, you come in new to organization, you get to know lots of people. But when you've been in an organization for quite a while, it is possible that we, what actually happens is we get that laziness. We think we know people and we, we don't make those efforts in, in getting to know people. So professional networking, it is a purposeful process. And that doesn't make you a bad person. Just because you actually look to, to connect with people because you have an agenda doesn't make you a bad person or Machiavellian in your outlook. But it, it shouldn't. It, but it does mean that when you look at your networks, you should look at them with an end in mind. So for me, for example, um, this year, 
uh, I knew that I was going to be involved with the PMO judging again. And I also knew that I was going to have to get a much more extended um, set of judges to be involved with the judging process. Um, and um, so I deliberately went out and I made my connections with people who are involved in PMOs overseas. Um, and I chatted to them during the year. And then when it got to August and I wrote to them to say, and by the way, would you mind being a judge? There was no barriers because I'd already created those relationships. Um, they, didn't, they weren't asking, where are you coming from? Why should I do something for you? We'd already had some of those connections going on. And for me, that's an example of purposeful networking. I don't think it made me a bad person that I sought them out. And I feel that we reciprocated our relationships in going through that. So it's about, I mean, I do sometimes say to my students at UCT, you know, you kind of know where you're doing good networking when you're going out with people that you don't like. But, but I don't want to be that cynical. What I mean is that there is a purpose behind what you're trying to do. And it's about building relationships. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, I suggest to people is that you do look at your networks. I'm not going to get you to do it today. But um, uh, the kind of things you want to ask yourself is how many new professional networks have you made? Another one is how diverse are they? Um, I feel quite fortunate that I work with students um, and with um, people in the professional environment um, so that I have quite a diverse, a diverse set of networks in terms of age. But maybe something to ask yourself in your own organisations, do you mainly know your peers? Do you know, mainly know the people who are the same age as you? And if so, maybe, just maybe, it might be worth just seeking out some of those new entrants, some of those younger people. See what views they've got about your project. See what views they've got about the organisation. And the idea is by looking at this, you can start to see where you might have some weaknesses in your network. So there's a link on here, and I'm going to give Diane that link and make sure we can find some way of getting it to you. And if you go to that, it takes you through a short blog and you can look at your own networks. Um, so in order to do networking, we talked uh, a little bit about- Are you able to put that in the chat or not? Yes, I can put that in the chat. Um, I Yes, I will do that in a second. Yes. I can't copy it from here for some reason, but I'll sort that out. Um, in order to um, look at your network, there are kind of three actions you take in terms of networking. One is to grow your network, find new people. And we talked about that. The other is to, to kind of keep your network warm. And the third one, which is um, sometimes... Um, people feel a little bit more uncomfortable, and I, I deliberately use this word, is to exploit your network. And that's the thing else I'd like you to do is to reflect back on the people you know and think, when did I last call on them to help me with something? And, and if you're not doing that, then you're not, you're not getting value from your network. Um, and maybe that's something you need to think of. And, and a lot of people are shy of this. Um, and, and I've had to learn, you know, sometimes I get it wrong and I ask people too early and they say, Go away, Louise. But um, uh, but but remember, this is one of the values you get from your network is the reciprocation. So go and have a look at that and remember that. So we're going to just briefly go back to our Mentimeter. Now, this is for the last time. So I'll just go back to Mentimeter. And I'd like you haven't done the questionnaire that I've done, but but given um, given what you um, have heard so far, if you were to take any actions or oh, prioritizing, sorry, I haven't spelt that right, which will you prioritize, um, would it be that you feel you need to grow your network, consolidate your network, exploit your network? Do you need to do more about actually sometimes reaching out to people or is it not important? Where, where would you put yourself right now? Okay, so you can see this coming in now. And I think most people feel that we can do more with our networks. Um, and this is, a, this is a kind of the classic curve I've seen. I've actually run this exercise um, with a, a group in the UK. And we had over 300 project managers online for that one. And, and same, same thing that they really felt the important thing at the moment for them was to grow the network and to make more use of it. And, and if I was to suggest you took anything away from this kind of thing is to think about what actions would you do in order to grow your network? What actions could you take in order to exploit your network? Okay, fantastic. 
Right, so um, I'm going to go back to our presentation and we're going to finish on a, a few areas, but you can take forward with this. One of the things I think that um, maybe we have is we have barriers to networking and we have reasons why we don't do it. Um, and this might be one of them. Networking is seen as a waste of time. Now, what I would argue for you on this one is that if you're not doing intentional networking and you're not doing that exploiting, then maybe you've done it and actually you've, you said it's a waste of time because you're not getting value from it. So the first thing I'd suggest to you, if you feel, feel it's a waste of time, is that maybe we need to be more purposeful in our networking. We need to seek out how we how we use, let's, let's use a nicer word, how do we um, make the best of our networks? How do we get value from them? Um, sometimes there's another reaction to this. This is this is fascinating. This actually, I put out a um, a blog uh, about a week ago now, and one of my network. This this person I've blocked her, so you can't see, but she's actually a engineer. She's from Sweden, and she she'd read my networking article and she said, "I I am agree." Her she's not English, obviously. She's Swedish speaking, and I think her English is fantastic for that. And she said, "I am agree, but a PM job within engineering needs a hundred and ten percent focus." Handling a tech technical team with all the issues, I love it, but I couldn't have time to take care of my networks. Now, I, I don't know how you feel about that. Please feel free to put your views in the chat area again. Um, I, th I thought it was great. I thought it was very helpful to get that, that kind of feedback, and I've heard it before. But I tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of me when I was a project manager programmer. It reminds me of me when I was actually a really good programmer um, and... Um, and I haven't hadn't understood management yet, if I were really honest. Um, uh, but you may not agree with me. But those are the kind of things that can also um, hold us back if we feel that we have to be so focused on the technical issues. Um, and and I I maybe would challenge that and say, well, at some point, you're not just an engineer, but maybe not. Um, the other thing that um, some people get worried about is it feels ins insincere. Um, it's not authentic. And I think the way of dealing with this is it, it, it's like when somebody reaches out to you on a, um, on a social media site. Ask yourself how you feel about that. I know what I feel like. When somebody reaches out to me on LinkedIn, I don't know about you, but the first thing I do is go and look at their profile. And if, if it doesn't look like they do project management, then I think, oh, dodgy character. <laughs> Maybe I won't connect with them. Um, and, and that's what people tend to do. When people reach out to them, maybe by an email or they reach out to them on LinkedIn, um, the first reaction of most of us is, what's their agenda? Um, so if you want to reach out and you don't want to come over as insincere, insincere manipulative, then why not tell people what your agenda is when you reach out to them? And um, I've tried this. I now find on LinkedIn, if I want to connect with somebody, um, I, I do tend to, um, I always send a message with the connection link. And I always start with something like, this is what I'm interested in. I wondered if this is what you were interested in. So that um, you kind of give people a chance to understand that, that you have an agenda, but you're actually going to share it with them. And that's true within the work situation as well. I have quite a few student interns um, and they've got to go into organization. They've got to get to know people. And I encourage them to go out and meet people in their organizations. And when they go and meet them to say, look, I'm a student intern, I've got so much to learn. Can I come and chat to you? And, and I, they find, they tell me that they get a much better reaction than just trying to book something in people's, meet, in people's meetings and saying, can I meet with you? So the other ones, um, this one is for extroverts. Well, I kind of, again, when I was an IT programmer, I think that's what I thought, but now I'd argue that it's a skill like any other. Networking is a skill like any other, and it's one of the skills that we have to develop. And, and yes, it might be out of our comfort zones, but the alternative is to stay in your comfort zone and to remain surrounded by people you know. And that limits your access to information. It limits your ac access to influence and to opportunities. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on this one, but this is an interesting one. Um, we tend to think our strong ties are the most valuable. So we tend to go and have coffee with our pals, our friends. Um, and, and there's been some work done on that. And you've probably come across it before in things like um, the tipping point. So, so just have a look at this as an example. Have a look at these two networks. Um, and there's Andrew's network and there's Linky's network. And perhaps reflect on how you think they are different in these two networks. So there's Andrew with all these different links and there's Linky with a different kind of linking network. 
Now, what you're probably starting to see is it does look a bit different. What's in, what's, what Andrew's got is Andrew's got what's called a classic closed network. Everybody in his network knows everybody else. Um, and, um, and, and that's great because it's like one of your really strong teams. They all know each other, um, but they only know each other. Whereas if you look at Linky's network, what she's got is she has got links into people like Johan. And this is um, a classic weak network or try again weak link. Because what's interesting about Johan is that he doesn't know Linky's other colleagues. He actually, but he does know people outside of Linky's normal network. Um, so weak ties are what makes us powerful. Um, and if you read the tipping point, it's one of the ideas that talked about in the tipping point, the idea of weak ties and strong ties. And, and Gladwell got some of his stuff from a guy called Mark Granavetta or something. And, and he did a study in, in, of people working in Boston. And he found that 56% of people or nearly 60% of people got their jobs through a personal connection. So not through, you know, they would talk to a friend and say, I'm looking for a job and their personal connections helped them. But of those connections who helped them get a job, most of them were weak ties. And by that, I mean, most of them were people who they rarely saw or rarely met or, or even went for a coffee with. But it was the people in their weak ties who connected them into broader networks and gave them the possibility of getting jobs. And, and what, what the argument is, or what Granovetta argues, is that when it comes to finding out new information, weak ties are more important than strong ties because your friends occupy the same world as you do. They might work with you or live near you and go to the same parties. How much then do you think they know that you don't know? And that's true in our project environment too, is that if we keep connecting with the people we know, we keep getting that same information. Whereas if we connect with people who we don't have such a strong relationship with, we hear different perspectives, we hear different views. So this idea of weak ties is something we can have a look at in terms of our own networks. Okay, I'm nearly there now. I've, I've mentioned LinkedIn. I'm a bit of a LinkedIn fan. This is my LinkedIn network. Um, and you can look at it yourself. You can use something called Sociolab. If you want to run your own LinkedIn network through Sociolab, it will do this wonderful picture for you. Um, and you can immediately start to see on here some of your weak ties. These, these are classic weak ties. These are people who I know but they don't know any of my other friends. But you can see in a classic network, you get all of these people who you know lots of them, but they all know people who you know, who you know, who you know. And you can see on LinkedIn when you know people and you say, and there are these many people in your, and these are the kind of closed network people, whereas these people over here give you an idea about going further. Um, for me, my online network is quite important, but remember that's because I partly because I work in things like education um, and I work in academia where I need to reach out to people who are working in my own space. But I think I, I know of other people on here who use LinkedIn quite a lot. Um, and um, for a few years, I had, uh, when I, I realized a few years back, I had over a thousand contacts, but I really only engaged with a couple of, a few of them, maybe, maybe 50 or so maybe less than that. So a couple of years ago, I tried testing my network and I, and I, rent, I wrote out on e email, that LinkedIn email process to my, to my contacts who I didn't normally talk with. And I sent them an email and I said, look, it's really great being engaged with you um, or being connected with you, but you know, obviously we don't engage very much. So maybe we don't have any common interests. Please feel free to disconnect from me. And I have to say, having, having written that, I thought that I would come out the next morning and I'd have no connections at all, but it didn't work like that. And actually what happened is that I found that there were some people out there who are in my network who are like lurkers. And, and lurkers is this idea of people who watch us on social media, but don't necessarily tell us they're watching. Um, and some of these people then wrote to me to say, no, I'm really interested in what you're doing here. And and this is this uh, link, this this way of classifying on, online friendships, which has come from somebody called Mike Aris. Um, and and what I found was that some of these passive interest people were actually doing things like sharing my links with other people, and and these people were therefore the ones that maybe I should start to do more with. And it's out of this kind of interaction that I got my first book deal, in fact, because I found somebody who was interested in writing a book with me. So this is um, uh, this this idea that even on the social networks, we can start to grow our, our relationships is something I find quite interesting nowadays. And I do actively seek out to in increase the depth of some of these relationships so that I can find new ways we can work together. So. A couple of years back now, I was working with um, a group of young entrepreneurs in Cape Town, 
and we were talking about networking and, and what was important to them. Now, the entrepreneur, entrepreneur, I can't even say the word, entrepreneur environment is tough. You have to drive yourself every morning. You have to inspire others. The energy has to come from you. Now, as a project manager, I'm sure these kind of problems sound familiar. So I asked them why their networks were important to them. And the first one they came up with, and I love the way this is directly how they expressed it. They worked on it and they came back to me and they said, networks connect us with opportunity. And I thought it was a fantastic phrase. What a positive way of saying, with it, saying it. And in project environment, I guess that would translate to networks connect you with the sources and power um, and influence necessary to get your project done. So that's a different way of looking at our networks. They connect us with those sources. They connect us with the sources of power and influence to get what we have to get done. And they also said this, and this was a surprise to me and, and actually changed some of the way I thought about my networking. Um, they, they said their networks were a source of energy and personal support. It was their networks who helped them get up in the morning and get back to being inspired, even when they were faced with these horrible things happening, like not being able to open their businesses and something like this. So, so I kind of finish on, on this one, and, and I've, I've kind of given you lots of ideas why networking I think is important, but, but I wouldn't underestimate how your networks can help you socially as well as in these other ways. They can be there to provide that up when you need an up, and they can be there to listen to you when you need someone to listen to you and maybe say, no, you're not doing the right kind of thing. So in, in summary today, I've argued the case for why I think networks matter in your projects. So yes, they provide us with this political support, this network into the organization that we certainly need in political, in, in complex projects so that we can get things done. We can use those persuasion techniques that Cialdini talks about like um, reciprocation, like getting people to want to come with us. Um, yes, they provide us information. And yes, they can also, something I haven't talked about today, but I certainly use, I use my networks for my own personal development, but I wouldn't emphasize, underemphasize these either. Um, uh, there are there are some people online. I think I saw Linky online, for example, who's a colleague of mine, who certainly is somebody who helps me in this, helping me with encouraging me, giving me support and energy to keep doing what I'm doing here. So in a tough environment that we live in in projects, for me, I'm going to argue that networking is worth doing. So I'll leave you with this encouragement. And that's me for today.